Hi everyone, my name is Med to Med. This video is going to be on some kidney terminology, nephrotic and nephritic. These terms can be quite confusing the first time you come across them, so I thought this would be a good area to focus on today. The notes I have made are based on the following resources. I've been using Scott's Notes recently, which is a really nice, concise resource to use. As always, I've been using the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine and utilising the NICE guidelines. As a disclaimer, I am a third year medical student. This video is not intended to be a substitute for any professional medical advice, and you should always consult your doctor about any health concerns. OK, let's look at the difference between these two syndromes. As you can see, I've highlighted the key difference between these two words. This makes things easier to remember. Nephritic syndrome involves inflammation, whereas nephrotic syndrome involves what I like to think of as round things like proteins and lipids and swelling. That occurs very commonly within this condition. I think it's a good idea to start off by looking at them separately. So let's take a look at nephrotic syndrome. This is a syndrome with a triad of three characteristics. The first is proteinuria. In particular, this is more than three grams per 24 hours passed in the urine. The next requirement is hypoalbuminemia. This means there is less than 30 grams per litre of albumin in the blood. Sometimes there can even be as little as 10 grams per litre. Lastly, the effects of both of these processes results in edema. So how does this happen exactly? Well, in order to understand these triad, we need to have an appreciation for how the kidney actually works. As you probably know, the functional unit of the kidney is called the nephron, as you can see on the screen. In particular, we have the renal corpuscle, which contains the glomerulus and the encapsulating Bowman's capsule. Podocytes, which you can see in the diagram, are the cells in the Bowman's capsule that wrap around the glomerulus. These play an important role in the prevention of protein leakage into the ultrafiltrate or the urine being made. In effect, it acts as almost a little sieve used to trap the proteins and, and it prevents them from leaving via the urine. Proteinuria, the first characteristic of nephrotic syndrome, re results from these podocytes having a pathology, so disease of these filtering cells. This results in hypoalbuminemia, as albumin, a protein, is lost during proteinuria. Proteins like albumin are responsible for maintaining a colloid osmotic pressure, which works against the hydrostatic pressure. And you should be able to see this in the diagram. The hydrostatic pressure is a pressure exerted by a fluid. If there is insufficient osmotic pressure, due to this al low albumin level in the blood we've mentioned, the fluid leaks into the interstitial tissues, which of course results in swelling or edema. You might notice significant peripheral edema in these patients, particularly around their ankles. In fact, there's a phenomenon known as pitting edema, which occurs when there is significant edema. This can be rapid and severe. When you press on areas such as the sacrum or the ankle, the skin indentation may persist for several seconds. So what causes this syndrome? We've spoken about the pathophysiology of the disease, but this doesn't actually explain why it starts manifesting itself. So the disease is either a result of a primary renal disease or is secondary to a pre-existing systemic disorder. OK, so there's a few types of primary renal disease. Remember, this isn't due to a pre-existing condition. First, we have minimal change glomerulonephritis, where damage cannot be seen under a regular microscope. This is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children. Then there is membranous nephropathy, which is common in adults and might actually be associated with an underlying malignancy. The formation of scar tissue in the kidney as a type of primary renal disease is termed focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, or FSGS for short. And lastly, there is membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, which is a rare disease and is due to an abnormal immune response. 
So we've covered primary renal disease. Now let's talk about the sort of systemic illnesses that can actually cause nephrotic syndrome. You've probably heard of diabetic nephropathy. Then there's lupus nephritis. This is renal disease and SLE where the autoantibodies attack the kidney. Myeloma patients have these abnormal plasma cells. These plasma cells do not make normal antibodies, but rather a type of protein. Amyloids in the kidney may lead to proteinuria as it harms the nephron. And lastly, severe preeclampsia may be associated with nephrotic syndrome as well. OK, so we've established how it happens and what causes it. So how do we treat it? You need to work on reducing the edema. This might be done by a fluid restriction, so usually less than one litre per day, and restricting dietary salt intake. You might actually need to diarise patients with loop or thiazide diuretics if it's resistant. Then you look at treating the underlying cause. All adults need a renal biopsy, which is easier to do once the edema, the edema has been reduced, which is why we do that step first. Corticosteroids may be effective in minimal change disease, as we've mentioned, as this is common in children, steroids are very effective and often biopsy in children isn't necessary at all. Proteinuria should be reduced by using ACE inhibitors and ARBs, but this might actually not be necessary in minimal change disease. Lastly, you need to be prepared for complications. This can be a bit tricky to think about, but clotting factors are proteins. We know they're developed by the liver. They may be lost in the urine where there is nephrotic disease due to this proteinuria. Because of this, patients are at risk of clots and are hypercoagulable. Of course, you treat this with heparin and warfarin. Again, immunoglobulins are proteins as well, so they also could be lost by the urine. And this puts patients at risk of infection, so you need to give the appropriate prophylaxis that's necessary, such as vaccination. Lastly, an increase in cholesterol could be due to the liver's response due to this decrease in osmotic pressure. So, as usual, you treat these with statins. OK, I think that pretty much covers it for nephrotic syndrome. So now let's look at nephritic syndrome. Remember, this is an inflammatory disease. You might have a patient who presents with hematuria, so blood in the urine. This occurs because of the disruption of the glomerular filtration barrier. Because of this pathology, red blood cells, albumin and large molecules can get filtered into the urine and results in this nephritic syndrome. Remember, nephritis just means inflammation of the nephron, so technically it can occur anywhere but often it results in the glomerulus, where it's called glomerulonephritis. It's different to nephrotic syndrome, which doesn't present with hematuria, because the inflammation results in thinning of the glomerular basement membrane. And then you have these small pore formations in the podocytes, which is allowing proteins and red blood cells to enter the urine. So we've already got an idea of some of the symptoms that the patients may have, so we've established that they may have hematuria, proteinuria, and actually as a result, hypertension. If there's damage to the nephron, this may reduce the glomerular blood flow. And as a result, there's less urine output or oliguria. Over time, all of these effects together may lead to progressive renal impairment. So let's look into the causes of nephritic disease. Some conditions are more common in adults and some in children, so some people prefer to separate these conditions into the condition according to the prevalence of their age. Let's go through a few examples. First, we have IgA nephropathy. This is actually more common in children, particularly those who have had upper respiratory tract infections. Simply put, there is too much IgA antibody in the glomerulus. Then we have a rare autoimmune disease called good pasture syndrome. Interestingly, this actually attacks both the lung and kidney basement membranes. If a young child starts having symptoms of malaise and nephritic characteristics, like we mentioned, so dark coloured urine, you should consider a post streptococcal infection, particularly if the child has had a sore throat or skin infection.
Lupus may also result in nephritis or nephrosis. As we've previously saw, it produces immune complexes which are deposited along this basement membrane of the glomerulus. Infective endocarditis can actually cause nephritic changes because you have these septic emboli which may develop from a valve thrombus. These are formed within the heart, obviously, where the valves are. They become a septic emboli and potentially could deposit in the glomerulus. We came across MPGN earlier, as it causes both nephrotic and nephrotic changes. Just to reiterate, this is a condition where the immune complexes are also deposited in the glomerular mesangium and results in basement membrane thickening. Of course, there are many other conditions which result in nephrotic syndrome too. With both of these syndromes, again, you want to do lots of tests if you suspect nephritis. Bloods, urine, chest x-rays and renal ultrasounds are all really good but renal biopsy is important for a definitive diagnosis. If you work through all of the tests I've listed here, you'll notice that some tests are particularly important for looking for specific causes, so you can work through each category separately. For instance, if I take testing immunoglobulins and looking at autoantibodies, you're thinking about those conditions that are related to autoimmune diseases. Again, there's a real similarity in treatment between nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. Really, you treat accordingly to the presentation of the patient. Typically, the patient needs to restrict fluids, adopt a particular diet, for instance, one low in sodium, and particularly, they may need to take diuretics to treat this fluid overload. If there's hypertension, you need to inhibit this renin-angiotensin axis by giving antihypertensives. And lastly, if you think your patient has significant like reduced kidney function or, or maybe even end organ damage, it might be necessary to consider dialysis. For some people though, a short course of dialysis can actually be really beneficial and kind of allows the kidney a time to de-stress and readjust to the new changes. Okay, I hope that's cleared up the confusion a little bit. So what are the most important points to take away? Nephritic diseases are inflammatory. There is thinning of the basement membrane and small pore formation. This is why hematuria occurs as so these small red blood cells can exit the urine as well as proteins. Nephrotic syndrome involves only proteins. There is no hematuria here. Renal biopsy is great for diagnosis, but don't forget to treat symptoms such as edema beforehand. You should treat both conditions according to the symptoms and blood levels the patient presents with. Don't forget to look at those levels, which may be a bit more subtle. The patient may not have symptoms of hyperlipidemia, but it's still equally as important to treat. When treating fluid overload, you should look into fluid restriction, advising dietary changes and giving diuretics. Lastly, always think about what could go wrong. We spoke about how other organs, such as the liver, respond to this low protein level in the blood. So always consider the non-renal complications. I hope you've enjoyed this video and happy studying.